Hey Jazz, nice to have you here. Pleasure to be here. It's, a, it, it's always fun seeing people all around the world and uh, finally getting a chance to sit down and have a conversation. Although it seems like uh, you've met our team before uh, in, in the past and, and we're just remembering. So at, with this I'd actually like to begin with you giving a little background uh, of how you got involved with uh, Consensus from Deloitte. Um, I mean, even before that, you have such a fascinating history coming from biology, uh, specifically studying molecular uh, basis of bacterial infection, stem cells, regeneration of aging, quant uh, quantitative statistics. I mean, it's, uh, it, I personally have, think that you could probably dive into the body and the patterns uh, and then taking that into Deloitte Consulting and then into the blockchain ecosystem. But I, I, I'm fascinated about that your path and how you got there. Yeah, I think that, that makes me sound a lot more impressive than I actually am. Um, so prior to, to joining Deloitte, as, as Scott mentioned, uh, I studied biology and that was my main degree um, where I specialized in all things to do with stem cells and we call them distributed neural networks at that point. Um, but throughout my whole degree, what most people didn't know about was I was that guy nerding out about blockchain in my spare time because, you know, who has spare time these days um, to do fun stuff at least. Um, and whilst I was doing that, I, I figured out that there was a lot of patterns to be built um, throughout my research and throughout the blockchain um, white papers and economics that I was designing and, and feeding into and, and building. Um, and following that, it fed into my kind of curiosity to join Deloitte um, and their technology consulting practice in particular, where I guess they realized I was um, a weird graduate analyst that knew perhaps a bit too much about blockchain um, than he was given. Um, and from that point onwards, I was put in charge of a bunch of different initiatives at Deloitte, uh, which involved a lot of their retail and automotive clients. Um, I then set up their ICO advisory team out in London um, before I bumped into a guy called Joseph Lubin uh, in London during a pizza meetup, similar to this actually. Uh, and three weeks later, I joined Consensus as the lead token architect. Um, I guess what that means in summary is I help design pretty much all the microeconomic incentive systems of like the networks that we've joined with, um, but that also includes the networks that we've launched, um, any kind of client side engagements on the enterprise side. Um, and that also means that I feed into a lot of product and platform development. So I've got my finger in a few different pies and uh, yeah, sort of a jack of all trades, but master of none. <laughs> um, so leading into the development part, uh, what do you think I feel like there's been a growing number of applications being built and developed. What do you see there to be to engage more users in the blockchain space in the specific networks? And what do you think the core thinking is around that? Sure. Um, that's a really interesting question. So I think that feeds into a larger pattern that I've been observing, at least. Um, and that is, as you said, applications that are being built at least over the last six to 12 months have focused on actually getting users to participate within either blockchain protocols, networks, or actual applications. Um, I'll give you an example. The most recent one today, uh, Stat Staked, uh, released their um, Robo Advisor Yield, stands for Ray. And um, apart from its demeaning name, it actually is a set of smart contracts which allows investors to pool a particular type of asset, for example, ETH or DAI or USDC, and the smart contracts will figure out the highest yielding protocol to invest those different pools of assets in. Prior to that, all these investors had to do was maybe put some money uh, or ETH or whatever it might be into Compound and then look for the next high yielding protocol and then physically take the assets out. Now there's a smart contract to do that. Now that's interesting. Um, but I think it feeds into like a wider picture, which is why are these applications being built? Um, you've got on your banner here, you know, re redefining blockchain UX. And I think that's exactly it. Um, right now, people have found it incredibly hard to onboard and participate within these blockchain networks. And building applications like these are much more conducive to society as we build, you know, as we strengthen these different networks. I'd say, and I, I guess it's part of my background. I want to put forward a, a contending point where all of this sounds great. And that is, 
okay, so I've just built out this cool interface which now feeds into Compound and DYDX and all these other protocols, and that's, and that's brilliant. But I'm wondering if people are actually focused on the underlying infrastructure. So I know a million code audits has been done for Compound and it's great. And it's on Ethereum as well, so I'm the, you know, the shell of Ethereum, right? But I'm always wondering that, are we building you know, a house that has a very strong foundational layer of bricks or is it a house of cards? Um, what if there's a code flaw in one of these things and you know, does, that, does that lead to the collapse of loads of different layers? So I think that kind of thinking has been really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Now, I don't know, when was it? You now just came out with a uh, reggae um, utility. About two months ago. Two months ago, okay. And they were, they were raising, what, $23 million on that? Uh, so there's been two recently, the block stack uh, and props. Do you see this being a, a pattern that's um, going to open the door for mass adoption, or is this a, a fallacy? Yeah, so I've been getting that question a lot. Um, so the example which Scott just, the two examples which Scott just provided were two or are two SEC um, approved utility tokens. And often people come up to me and they say, hey, is this now what ut utility tokens are gonna look like? Is this what the next wave of tokens are gonna look like? And it's interesting because I'd say there's two thoughts aligned around this. The first is um, what's regular, regulatory approved utility tokens in a framework that is considered law? And what do people think is sufficient decentralization? Um, from, if we use props for example, um, cool, it's a loyalty token which uses um, on you now when they create content or if they share content, if they want to flag content, they can use these tokens to, to highlight this. And they benefit this in the form of they get a discount to buy their actual native um, currency, which has got nothing to do with blockchain aside from that. But you ask yourself, is that fully decentralized? Um, for example, users who are able to trade that props token need to be KYC. They need to be approved beforehand to be able to send. And like, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that's good. Um, but I'm saying I think there's a little bit more creativity and length to run on what's a utility token than what the SEC has approved so far. But I mean, you now has been around for many years as a company. I remember, you know, being at their meetups back in like 2011, 2012, when when they were just kicking things off. And I think they pivoted maybe once or twice prior to that. Uh, do you think the SEC had any decision making to look at them? And listen, it's a real company. They've been around for a long time. They're not out to harm anyone, um, and they actually have a use case uh, for their ecosystem. Yeah, I think they did, um, and I think it doesn't surprise me at all that the SEC has taken this approach with their particular token because I'd argue it's the safest they could have possibly have made it. Um, a loyalty token isn't necessarily going to hurt anyone. Um, the real value where people put fiat into is into actually their, I forgot what the name of their other points system is, but it's, it's for that. So I'd say, yeah, they've, they've thought a lot about it. Um, I'd say that they're starting to put out examples of these other types of digital assets to basically test the field. And if anything collapses, it wouldn't be too major. Um, and that's me pu putting my critical hat on, I guess. Um, it, looking from uh, the consensus eyes and having access to the portfolios and um, the conferences that you're going to, seeing the different um, new wave of technology being built, what's other patterns you're seeing uh, besides everyone trying to create some type of mass adoption? Because I think that's just people waking up and like, listen, if we can't get people using it, what, what the heck are we doing? Yeah. Um, so I'd say one of the more recent ones, well, I guess not recent because it's been in the works for a while, particularly on the consensus side, um, is interoperability. Um, you may have seen a few announcements recently, but, you know, for example, us becoming a premium member of the Hyperledger yeah. Foundation. Um, these, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, it's just, uh, we're realizing more and more that it's important that all these different ecosystems need to have some sort of communication or overlap with each other. Um, I feel like we're all building in our own little siloed communities, and that's great because I think community is extremely important for these blockchain systems to grow and fruition and et cetera. But working together is going to be the actual real stigma that we need to overcome. <laughs> Which poses another question. How do we reach out to the different chains and different communities and say, listen, if we don't work together, 
and, and use our pooled resources, we don't know where this is going to go. We have an idea, we see the logic behind it, we know that it, it has to take place, but we can work together and speed things up. Yeah, so it's funny because there's, there's two main touch points that I have when anyone asks me, you know, how do you think other protocols are doing? And I look at two things. Uh, one is the developer community and what they're building. They're normally the people that just put their heads down and build and don't listen to anyone else. And we, we agree with you as Portis, you know, we, are, we believe in interoperability. Uh, we started obviously with uh, Ethereum because, uh, you know, we saw the developer community there and we believed in it and we understood that Ethereum is something that you wouldn't have to explain to your parents, whereas some of these other protocols you still do, right? And so we built an architecture which enables you to communicate back and forth from EOS, Bitcoin, um, multiple side chains, uh, and we support, you know, 15 different chains right now. Uh, because in the end, it's not going to be, oh, I, I, you're using this chain and that chain? No. The user shouldn't know. You know. It should purely be about the value that they're gaining. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if you have another protocol which builds, you know, um, a huge market ecosystem for gaming, for example, um, I don't think the right move then would be for um, for example, Ethereum to then be like, okay, well, we're not gonna, we're gonna sack all interoperability with them and try and do it ourselves. Doesn't make any sense because for an outside user, for a retail consumer, which I think actually a lot of people are focusing on now more than ever, um, people need to figure out how they're going to visualize all of these products. They're not gonna see a game that's doing amazingly well on EOS, for example, and then compare that to something on Ethereum. They'd look for a communication between them both. Can I move my assets between them, for example, etc. So yeah. Interesting you say that. Um, okay, uh, let me, what about roadblocks? Obviously besides the ones of how do we work together, uh, where things are going, what technology exists, but in a perfect world, what are the roadblocks you see today um, and moving forward from there? Um, honestly, one of the things I talk about the most probably is governance. <laughs> um, if I, you know, if I had a dollar for every time someone raised, hey, I've got this really neat way for on-chain governance to work, um, I'd probably be richer than I already am. Um, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, but the idea is, how are these different protocols governed? Um, you look at the Bitcoin maximalists, and it's, everything is decentralized, there's no highest speaking individual that's working on all this. But I could then argue, well, you've got a bunch of different developer groups, um, smaller than the amount on Ethereum at least, that are leading the charge on building out Lightning Network, et cetera. And they're being funded by, I guess, some sort of investment from another capital party. If I was to be, if, if I was to put my critical hat on, then you have ETH who's working on, you know, Serenity 2.0, ETH 2.0, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and you have six different groups that are working on like clients and sharding and, and a bunch of different re research initiatives. Then you have perhaps more as publicized, centralized um, protocols, which, you know, have like a foundation or one concrete foundation. And then their plan is to release and allow more decentralization as it goes. I'm not saying there's any one right answer. Um, I'm just saying that it's interesting to see how these different models work out. And I'd argue that the reason why we're not seeing that interoperability that we so desire so much right now is because people haven't found out how to work together. Or what's the best way to execute decision-making power? And that's so important. Um, one thing that I've noticed over the last couple of weeks at ETH Berlin and ETH Boston is everyone loves DAOs all of a sudden. This is the trending theme. <laughs> that's been happening over the last couple of months. Um, and people are trying to nail and figure out how DAOs work. And I feel like this is like when security tokenization was, was being spoke, spoken about. And I'm still waiting for mass adoption of STOs that was supposed to happen last year. Um, so I think it's a, it's a thought process. Um, I think governance is a big thing. And then obviously infrastructure. Uh, we are nowhere near where we need to be. Um, but that's not a bad thing. Um, the problems that we're trying to solve, and I'll be more ETH maximalist here if you like, um, sharding um, and uh, all these different kinds of mechanisms are incredibly hard to solve. Um, they're not going to turn around tomorrow, um, but they're on their way. And what we have now is a completely distributed community that are working on this in silos and, and trying to figure it, this, this issue out. It's, it's a collective effort. And I think once more people put their heads together from differing protocols and actually work together to find a solution, 
um, we're going to get somewhere pretty fast. And that's why we've done like stuff like the Hyperledger Foundation. And Would you say um, Consensus and Joe are, 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 are attempting to be the Arthur's Roundtable of, uh, of interbridging the interoperability and yeah, coming together and working together? because I actually used that exact analogy with him about two weeks ago. Um, he chuckled, I don't know what the hell that means. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say that is the case that I think, to be honest, I think the heads, the de facto heads of all these different ecosystems have realized that. Um, and I don't think they're, you know, too impartial to it. So I'd say that's the trend that people are taking, but I won't speak on behalf of Joe. That's great news. Okay. If, if, if I'm building something, I want to be more interoperable. I want to, you know, I've talked to all the different chains. Uh, I've dabbled in a lot of different uh, builds, but I'm just a single developer. Uh, and I want to be more productive in, you know, creating a community and working together with everyone. Can I contact you? Yeah. Can I help the organization out? What's the next steps? Yeah, so there's quite a few different avenues that you can approach um, us at Consensus. Um, one of the more prevalent ones right now is something called Consensus Grants. Um, grants are essentially amounts of money that we disperse to teams or individuals that have a cool idea or want to build out an infrastructural component of the ecosystem. Um, we take you know, a lot of time to go through your applications. Um, Wave 2, I believe, is closing in about two weeks' time. So you know, visit our website and check that out. Um, if you guys are a larger scale project and you'd like to approach us about um, sort of bigger integrative efforts, um, feel free to reach out to either myself or the guys at Consensus Labs to approach that. Uh, any questions for Ejaz? Hey. Um, so one more interesting thing that I noticed that like last uh, several days of all the events is that everyone keeps talking about mainstream adoption, mm -hmm. mainstream adoption, mainstream adoption, and it was a breath of fresh air actually being Scott at the TV because <laughs> no one actually spoke about the UI UX and helping you know people. Yeah. Um, you know, like the, the fact that people don't need to like understand this for the background. Mm -hmm. But do you see any reason why almost no one is focusing on the customer experience side? Like UI UX is almost impossible. Like, is someone being out, someone outdated? Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, that's why I said, you know, I'm going to talk to Scott, but uh, almost no one actually, any of these events, is speaking about the customer experience, mm -hmm. it's the onboarding and the experience, and then it's interoperability and how well it works faster. Mm -hmm. and, you know, throughput and all these different things, but yeah. no one, almost no one, is speaking about customer experience. Yeah. And do you see that as a problem as an addition to mature in the field? Absolutely. Uh, I, I see that as a huge problem. Um, I think, and I'm going to fully put my hand up here and admit this, um, that you and I have differing opinions on the definition of user UX, I guess, and, and, and UI. That's completely what I meant. I was encompassing all of that. Um, one really exciting thing, and I'm being very sarcastic here, that I've been doing over the last three months is extensive user testing and researching uh, with individuals, which basically I've never, I've heard of focus groups, but I've never actually led one. Um, I'd say I've done more exciting things in my life, but it's extremely, extremely captivating. Um, and like, I, I, I can't disclose why we're, we were doing that user research testing, but I can say it's hugely valuable. And I'll tell you a difference. Um, yeah, exactly. But I'll tell you the difference because that's where my data scientific side comes out. Um, I was doing that in 2017, and all the data we had there are completely skewed. <laughs> it does not apply to the world that it does right now. And it was very easy for people back then in 2017 and early 2018 to simply go, um, I don't need to rely on that data. I have a good gut feeling. Look at the price of my token saw. I'm going to be OK. Now, throughout the end of 2019, uh, sorry, throughout the end of 2018 and definitely throughout 2019, I found that the opinions and user feedback is actually more valued. Um, and the actual user testing that we're doing is not just with like retail customers, so you know, the market that we hope to capture, but it's with people that have been existing in the ecosystem for a while and maybe who have burned out um, during the downturn. And so I'd say that's an extremely important issue that needs to be addressed. Not enough people are doing it. Um, and that's why Scott managed to get me here, because of that reason that you mentioned earlier. So yeah. Small question that the focus groups are they crypto-based people or mainstream? Uh, both. So that's what I meant by people in the space versus people that we hope to attain. Yeah. So for example, um, I'll just give you an example. Uh, someone 
who, and like this was like a group of people that we interviewed that had purchased ETH and Bitcoin way back in the day um, and who, was, who have heard of MakerDAO. So I asked them to talk me through their process of setting up a CDP, for example. Not the easiest thing. And there was a lot to be learned from that. We fed that user feedback back to MakerDAO and you know, hopefully there'll be new and exciting things to come. They are. Well, anyways, EJS, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you here. And uh, I, I look forward to hearing the good things from Consensus. Thank you so yeah. much. Oh. Yes. Do you guys at Consensus think that as the efforts for bringing an injured blockchain or an injured liability solutions to the space are increasing, are you guys trying to kind of maybe uh, lowering the focus on Ethereum development as the uh, more in blockchain general mass adoption kind of focus. Uh, and in terms of like, if, if a fully scalable solution for Ethereum would come in the form of a second layer solution, mm -hmm. would efforts of putting out uh, Ethereum 2.0 increase in some way? Or? Is that a parallel thing? How, how do you see, how, how do you see like, the conversion? Sure. Um, so I think consensus will always be a proponent for Ethereum, regardless. Um, I think it's a matter of essentially stepping up our efforts and budget in all the parts that we've been slightly lacking in. So when we talk about ramping up efforts for second layer scaling solutions, yes, that support will most definitely be there. For example, we love what the guys are doing at Loom. Um, we love what the guys are doing at things like Scale and stuff like that. So yeah, if something like that was to come to fruition, which they are, support will always be led there. Um, but I, there we go. That, that's awesome. Cortis is shining here. Um, but I think it's. It's got to be a strategic process because I wouldn't say that if a second layer scaling solution suddenly shot up, that we should then abandon all Serenity 2.0 architecture because you're talking about literally first layer and second layer. And I could think of a bunch of different reasons which you probably already know um, as to why you know both constructs have very different purposes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a combined effort, but just know that we're paying more attention. All right, thanks, Jess. Thank you so much.